Welcome everybody to this uh, interview and conversation with Michael Sandel. Uh, he's a very, very well-known uh, moral philosopher. He teaches government theory at Harvard University Law School, and uh, he has been teaching to tens of millions of people through television, uh, YouTube, and other means uh, about justice, the, uh, the word that uh, he has uh, helped us understand by showing how our daily life and uh, uh, normal life is full of social dilemmas that we should deal with that he is able to to show how to do this in a deep and uh, uh, concerned and uh, sensible way um, he has been writing about neoliberalism uh, since the 80s and he has been criticizing that kind of uh, uh, approach uh, since then uh, in the 40 years of uh, uh, neoliberal uh, uh, domain uh, has been uh, one of the voices that always showed another way of thinking uh, now he is out uh, uh, also in Italy with Feltrinelli translation of his last book, The Tyranny of Merit. You can see it here, but uh, uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, talking about uh, uh, a very controversial and uh, interesting topic, meritocracy and the tyranny of merit is uh, is really a way of putting the problem of how we live in a very uh, interesting and problematic way. Of course, uh, we are going to start with uh, uh, Professor Sandel explaining what uh, he thinks about meritocracy and why we should be uh, looking into this uh, uh, more deeply. Uh, but of course, uh, let me say that this is really something that we need to think about uh, a lot. Uh, as you know, we are translating this into Italy. Italy is a place in which meritocracy is still some concept uh, that is seen as innovative. We are a country in which we complain a lot about ourselves is not because we are humble, it's because we, are, we, we work like that, we, we, uh, we complain. And one way of complaining is that our leadership, our power, our social system is organized on the basis of social relations. So is the friends of friends that go up, it's not those that merit to be in the leadership. So, when we talk about meritocracy here, it seems to be the innovation, the, the way of creating a society in which capability uh, and engagement and vision become uh, the reason why people should go up instead of social relations and friendships and uh, mafia kind of things. So you are in, an, in a country in which this is the context. How do you put the meritocracy criticism in a place like this? Well, first, let me say what an honor it is to be in conversation with you about the, the tyranny of merit. And you've begun with a challenging question. We normally think of merit as a good thing is an ideal worth aiming at as an aspiration. And if the alternative to merit is corruption or nepotism or family connections, then the principle of merit is very attractive. It's attractive more broadly because we want well-qualified people to perform the social roles 
that they are good at. If I need a surgery, I want a well-qualified surgeon to perform it. So in this sense, merit is a good thing. So you raise the question, how can merit become a kind of tyranny? In the following way, we have to step back and look at what's happened in recent decades to our social and political life. Over the past four decades, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. This is partly because of the widening inequalities brought about by neoliberal globalization. But it's not only that. I think it has also to do with changing attitudes towards success that have accompanied the widening inequality. Those who've landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing and that they therefore deserve the rewards the market showers upon them. And by implication, that those left behind must deserve their fate as well. Now, this way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive principle, the principle of merit, the principle that says, if chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. Now, meritocracy understood in this way has a dark side. There are two problems, really. One problem is the one that you mentioned in setting the context. We often don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess. But here's the philosophical question. Even if we did, even if we could establish genuine equality of opportunity, would that make for a just society or for a good society? I think it wouldn't, would not for the following reason. Meritocracy is corrosive of the common good and of solidarity. And the reason it's corrosive of the common good is that it creates a society of winners and losers. It, the idea that the winners have earned and therefore deserve their success creates meritocratic hubris among the winners and creates demoralization even humiliation among those who don't succeed in rising. It leads the winners to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way. And it leads elites to look down on those who haven't flourished. So this is my reason for suggesting that merit meritocracy can become a kind of tyranny by creating a society of winners and losers, where those who were well credentialed, the meritocratic elite, look down on those who haven't flourished, and where those who struggle sense that looking down, sense that, and, and, and develop a kind of resentment that leads them to embrace an angry, populist backlash against elites. Yeah, the, the common good is really the topic of your book. The, we, yeah. we, we need to regain an idea of that. But we will right. come to that. Uh, let me just discuss a little bit more about this uh, question of merit. Um, I would like to uh, propose you two examples. One is Bill Gates is the is a person that I used to interview when he was uh, in software, um, and uh, as, you, as everybody knows, he's uh, one of the founders of uh, Microsoft. He's been the most the richest person in the world for 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 a long time. Uh, he's now the, a, a philanthropist. When he he was asked uh, how come he had such a biography he just answered uh, i was 
in the right place at the right moment, which is, you know, another narrative, a completely yes. different narrative as the, the merit. Today I was second, second little thing to comment. Today I was uh, teaching my students in Pisa and they, uh, and, and I asked them, what, what should I ask Professor Sandel? Um, and he said, they, one of them, they said, uh, well, I was adopted. When I was very, very small child, I was in El Salvador. Uh, I had no future. I had the chance of this family that came there and adopted me and brought me to Italy. And now I'm in, the, in the university. This is my second uh, graduation. I'm uh, very happy. And he is a great person. He's doing research and things that are amazing. So in these two cases, the narrative is, seems to be, you know, unlucky. Uh, is it, is it better to, to the, the rhetoric of merit or the rhetoric of, well, it happened? These are two wonderful examples. I think the narratives they express come close to the moral perspective that I argue for as the antidote to the tyranny of merit, as an antidote to meritocratic hubris. What these two stories express is, I think, a powerful ethical insight, which is even those of us who work very hard, who expend enormous effort, should not assume that everything we're able to achieve is our own doing, the result of our own effort. Because there are lots of contingencies in life that make for success and for achievement. As your student and as Bill Gates uh, expressed, there's the contingency of having the talents that enable one to succeed but having this or that talent is not my own doing. However hard I might work to cultivate that talent, it's a matter of gift. And having the gift of being talented in this or that way is not something that I have done or achieved myself. More than that, the fact that the talents I happen to have are prized and valued and rewarded by the society in which I live, that too is not my doing. That too is a matter of luck. If, if Bill Gates had lived back in the days of the Renaissance, his talents for mathematical thinking, for software development, uh, and so on, might not have gotten him very far. They cared more about fresco painters then than they did about software developers. Right place at the right time. That was his point. And the general, the, the general lesson of these two stories is that being aware of the accidents and contingencies that enable us to succeed or to achieve can be an antidote to meritocratic hubris and can prompt a certain humility. The humility that says there, but for the accident of fortune or the grace of God or the mystery of fate, go I. And when we think this way, not only are we prompted to a certain humility, we are also open to a sense of indebtedness to the communities that made our success possible. Our indebtedness to family and teachers and neighborhood and community and country and the times in which we live. And from this indebtedness can come a, a greater tendency to think about what we owe in virtue of our indebtedness to other members of our society who may not have had as many lucky 
accidents as we. So in this way, an awareness of the role of luck in life can prompt a certain humility, which can open us to the possibility of a greater sense of solidarity and mutual obligation. This is really something to think about. The, the, the lucky part of the, the narrative of Bill Gates, and it's, it's, not, it's not random. It's, uh, there, there, are, there are causes of it. There are links, there are stories, and all these need, uh, uh, deserve our, 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 uh, uh, to be thankful for, and, and so we become humble and that uh, is the premise for solidarity and everything. So this is a really important point and I, I think it's uh, something to, to, to discuss. And one way to discuss it is uh, to ask Professor Sandel if uh, this kind of idea would change if we were uh, discussing about this in China or in, in India or in a completely different cultural setting. Uh, I know he has been working on Chinese philosophy uh, and, uh, and, and I wonder if, you know, this idea of a collective uh, organism that uh, seems to be more uh, used in a, in a in a in a in a situation like the Chinese cultural setting uh, brings the same kind of uh, ideas that he proposes for the American setting, which is clearly more adapt to this criticism. There are certainly cultural differences that shape attitudes toward luck on the one hand and hard work and self-mastery as a source of success on the other. I have had opportunities to travel in China and to engage with uh, scholars of Chinese philosophy on some points of similarity and some points of difference between Chinese philosophical traditions and my own work. The common thread, um, takes as its point of departure, I suppose, that I've been a critic of the excesses of individualism and of individual sovereignty and self-making that are a powerful current in Western political philosophy. But I can't present myself as a scholar of Chinese philosophy, so I, I hesitate to generalize about it. But I do think that as a matter of politics and culture, there are different orientations to questions of how we succeed, how we achieve, and to what extent we are responsible for our fate. Part of the appeal of the meritocratic principle is not only that rewarding successful people gives an incentive for people to work hard. That's a practical utilitarian reason, but there's, there's a deeper appeal to the, merit, to the idea of merit. And that's the, the alluring ideal that we can be free human agents and can determine our own fates, that we can be the masters of our destiny, that we are ultimately self-made and self-sufficient as individuals. And we can therefore exercise freedom understood as a kind of mastery. There is something deeply powerful about this idea, especially in the West, and perhaps especially in America, which often defines the American dream as the ability to rise thanks to one's own effort and determination. And I've argued against this way of thinking about human agency, but it's important to recognize its appeal. It exerts a powerful allure. And I think the only way 
uh, really to challenge it and to persuade people to reconsider it is to argue, not to argue against freedom and human agency, but to show the idea of the self-made, self-sufficient individual human agent is flawed. It's a flawed conception of freedom. Instead, and this is implicit in the new book, The Tyranny of Merit, we need to embrace and to enact a conception of freedom that is not the freedom of the individual self, self-sufficient uh, figure, but it's a kind of civic freedom that we exercise human agency when we live in a society that enables us to deliberate with fellow citizens as equals about the collective destiny, having a voice, a meaningful say in the purposes and ends that we as a community should pursue. That's civic freedom. And it's a kind of freedom that depends not on an unencumbered, radically autonomous self. It's a conception of freedom that depends on seeing ourselves as situated, as encumbered, as indebted, and therefore as sharing and responsibility for the community as a whole. This gets to the idea of the common good. It's a, it's a notion of individual agency, sorry, it's a notion of human agency and of freedom bound up with a collective deliberation about the common good, about the purposes and ends worthy of us. And so the only way truly to argue against a neoliberal market-driven meritocratic society is to take on this conception of human agency and to offer another, I would say, richer civic conception of freedom as an alternative. Yeah, this is um, absolutely important. I, uh, I, it's not, it's not a place of uh, self quotations, but uh, I've, I've been writing a book that is called homo pluralis to say this to the, we are not individuals without uh, links and uh, dimensions that are communitarian and, and and collective and the civic media domain is the way in which we can uh, respond to this in in, a, in an interesting way but let me just we go to this let me just have another question on the uh, Dance which is the con about the conception of uh, the definition of success. Uh, yeah. We we can we can remember uh, here in Italy there is uh, there has been a, a very important entrepreneur of television that has become uh, a prime minister uh with ideas that um, were very uh, got a lot of consensus in italy and he stayed in power for 20 years um yeah. his uh he, he, used, he used to say that success today has changed he said uh he's called the silvio berlusconi of course yeah. uh yeah. he said um today we don't look for wealth or power we need to look for to seek popularity because if you have that then wealth and power come uh, so it seems there is a different you know a setting in which uh, success is about popularity yeah. um, there is uh, in italy completely different idea of success uh, and we have tons of uh, 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 many 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 uh, thousands of entrepreneurs of people or artisans of craftsmen that if you ask them i do they they always answer their success is to do things well to do to make things that are good that are made well like as if success was just to express the best of yourself. Right. Uh, these two 
ideas that are seem to be very different one another they, they live together in the same country yeah. uh, what is success well i like the second conception of success that you articulated far more than the first and i should say that the notion of success as beginning with popularity rather than with intrinsic achievement this has spread well beyond Italy, as you may have noticed with the rise of Donald Trump. In fact, it turned out when, when, when people looked into his finances, it's a myth that he became wealthy by building things. He became wealthy by being a television personality and licensing his image. That's how he made his money, not really by, by building things and developing things. That was the sort, so popularity and really the cultivation of a certain image through the media was the source of both Donald Trump's wealth and power. So I think there is a powerful parallel here. And what it misses is the second kind of achievement that you mentioned, what I would call intrinsic, uh, in the intrinsic kind of achievement, making and producing and creating valuable things that may also give expression to the personality and creativity and imagination of the person who produces them. And this, I think, the distinction that you've drawn, I think is very important for understanding what's gone wrong with our public life and with our economy. Because the activity of producing, creating, building, making, whether in the form of manufacturing, well, there's the artisan ideal, which underlies the account you gave, more broadly, there's the idea of an economy consisting of producers who make things or perform valuable services that meet human needs. These are the intrinsic goods that an economy is organized to serve and to provide. But increasingly, the rewards in our societies have gone not to those who make and produce valuable goods and services that serve human needs. But the rewards have gone to those who have managed to manufacture the kind of popularity you've described, whether through the media or through YouTube performances, and to those who manage money. We've had a, a financialization of the economy that in some ways is parallel to the idea that popularity generates wealth and power in the sense that it's at a distance from the real economy of goods and services, of making and doing in a way that meets important human needs. And so who are those, who are the figures who reap the greatest rewards in this economy. Uh, we could all, almost call it, I suppose, an economy of celebrity and finance. What celebrity and finance have in common is that they are ways of generating wealth and power and prestige without working. I mean, without working in the traditional intrinsic sense of producing goods or providing services that meet truly important needs. An economy of celebrity and of finance uh, allocate uh, power and wealth based on a kind of abstract contribution whose relation to the common good is at best tenuous. And I think part of what we need to do as a counterweight is to find a way to renew the dignity of work, 
the dignity of making and producing and doing tied to actual human needs. As a counterweight to the economy of celebrity and financial speculation and manipulation that currently is the source of the most lavish rewards and wealth and power. Yeah. And what do you, what do you this think? Is, I, I was thinking when you were talking about work, which is uh, really, uh, I mean, is the place in which dignity and our social role and our value to society are expressed and, uh, and it's and it's important the international labor organization has changed the definition of work is not anymore the activity that you are paid for it's the activity that has that gives value to society even if it is right. not paid uh, yes and, and it's yes. It's very interesting. Um, but then we need to talk about value for society. What, what's common yeah. good? This is yes. our major subject. And this is difficult to see in a, in a context in which everybody has his own, seems to be have, have to, to have his own idea of what is common good. Um, <laughs> Only one thing I, I think it's going to become really common good. And uh, again, it's a student of mine today. I asked uh, who is a successful person for them. And he answered right away. It is Federico Garcia, who has started a startup, which is called Tridom. And they plant trees all over the world to save mm. uh, the, the planet from climate change. Right. Uh, climate change, the common good, climate change. It's, it's the beginning of common good. I mean, we want to save uh, uh, us from uh, climate change because humans can bring, can have a common good, can bring a common good to the planet. But this is the starting point for a lot of young people. Yeah, yeah. I think that the focus on the common good and on the dignity of work go together and can provide a counterpoint to an economy of celebrity and of finance in the following way. But you, you raised just now implicitly the, the biggest challenge to a, a moral economy and a political economy that seeks the common good. And the challenge is that this requires that we as democratic citizens deliberate and argue and debate what really counts as a valuable contribution to the common good. For decades, the market triumphalist faith has taught us the opposite lesson. It's taught us that markets and market mechanisms are the primary instruments for defining and for implementing the common good. And we easily slide into the assumption that the money people make is the true measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. A moment's reflection can tell us of many instances where the labor market's verdict on what counts as a valuable contribution is at odds with what most of us would agree is very important. For one thing, as you pointed out, many of the most important contributions to the common good, even to the economy broadly conceived, do not involve paid labor. What about raising and nurturing children and families? For the most part, this is outside the labor market. And yet no one would deny that this work constitutes 
an enormous contribution to the common good. Or take, even within the paid labor market, the vast disparity between the pay of a hedge fund manager and a nurse. The hedge fund manager makes 900 times what a nurse makes. Even the most ardent free market defenders would be hard pressed to claim, I think, that the contribution to the common good of the hedge fund manager or the high frequency trader is really 900 times greater than the contribution of a nurse. So we need to question the assumption that money or the labor market can define the value of social contribution. But here's the challenge, and it's the challenge that you referred to. This means that we as democratic citizens have to figure this out, have to deliberate about what really counts as a valuable contribution. And because this, this would make, it, this would require us to bring contested values into public debate. Because in pluralist societies, people disagree about how to value this or that social role. There's room for debate. And I think one of the reasons we tend to outsource our moral judgment about contribution to markets is we want to avoid these messy, contentious debates about values and how to value various contributions and social roles. But this hesitation we have, I think is one we should overcome because outsourcing our moral judgments about contribution and value to markets does not decide these questions neutrally. It leads to certain outcomes deeply at odds with what our reflective judgment about value and contribution would suggest. So in a way, what I'm calling for is something that I suppose is politically ambitious, but I would say unavoidable, which is a morally more robust kind of public discourse than the kind to which we've become accustomed. Absolutely. And I want to show our uh, public uh, this other book from, from you is What Money Can't Buy is, of course, about this kind of value that uh, is not paid for, but has a lot of value, social value, moral value and cultural value. and. It's the sense of our life. Love is not for pay, for, for, for money. Uh, right. So, uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a really important uh, thing that you're talking about and debate, debate, which is not the li deliberation as, uh, of course, is not this decision. The liberation is uh, looking what's the best argument, what's um, debating. It's debating yes. about uh, the, the before decide. So uh, having a good information uh, and debate with our uh, ability to argue and have uh, positions. And, and this is of course something that people longs for because when they mm. look at your lessons, they, they, they are there for the nostalgia of a debate right. uh, at, in a way. So uh, how do we create a debate? I mean, it's uh, the market has been for Hayek uh, the way to decide, to inform, to decide. And it was uh, an architecture that was uh, not centralized as the communist uh, solution. So it was a, a question of uh, another era. Now we are in an era in which the internet is a place in which we can debate, but we don't, we just argue, we just fight, we, or at least right. we, we do many things, but not <laughs> Mud, uh, uh, debating better than 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 in another situation. We have an opportunity there to yeah. build uh, civic media instead of social media. But yeah. then, uh, uh, Prof. 
Professor Sandel, the question of, of the question, how do we do it? Well, it's, it's a really important question. And I, I would uh, attempt to answer it this way. First, the kind of civic debate we need would make for a richer kind of public discourse. What passes for political discourse these days, as you've suggested, consists either of narrow technocratic talk, which inspires no one, or where passion does enter, we have shouting matches where people shout past one another on cable television or on radio or on the floors of parliaments. And citizens, pe people want public life to be about big things, including questions of values. What, what makes for a just society? What should be the role of money in markets in a good society? What do we owe one another as citizens? I think people everywhere are frustrated with the empty terms of public discourse because public discourse has been morally hollowed out. So I think this represents an opportunity. And I see this everywhere I travel. I think the people, the reason people, especially young people, uh, uh, have responded in the astonishing way they have to the online lectures or when I do these interactive lectures around the world is that people are hungry for reasoned deliberation and debate in public about hard ethical questions that arise in politics and in our everyday lives. People are hungry for this. So how might we create more space for it? Uh, that, that's the question. Now, I think we have to do it in two ways. First, you, you made this very important distinction between social media and civic media. The internet does provide the possibility for a richer kind of deliberation, but for the most part, that possibility has not been realized because the internet has been commandeered in the service essentially of consumerism and celebrity and spectacle, all of which are antithetical to the civic project. So we need to create platforms for public discourse, and I would say even global public discourse, this is what's exciting about the internet, being able to bring people together from different cultural backgrounds to deliberate questions such as climate change, immigration, equality and inequality, how to deal with the pandemic. I've, I've tried to do some experiments along these lines. After we put the my lectures on justice online and saw the response, I wanted to go further and see if we could use the internet and new technology for dialogue, not just putting out lectures, but for dialogue. And we've done some experiments with a, a series that I've done for the BBC called The Global Philosopher, where we link participants from as many as 50 or 60 countries and can see one another on a screen. This was before Zoom, but Zoom actually makes this easier. And take a question and debate it uh, globally uh, to see how people from different cultural backgrounds, different countries grapple with these questions of justice, inequality, climate change, immigration, free speech versus hate speech, and so on. So I think a lot more could be done to create civic forums, platforms for national and global public discourse, but it requires a deliberate effort and creativity and experimentation to see how best we can do it. That's one way. But there's a second way, which does not involve the internet alone. I think for all its promise as a platform for civic dialogue, 
the internet is not enough. I think we still need to supplement <clears throat> the internet with face-to-face -face community. I don't think we should give up on that. Historically, bringing people together physically, it's difficult during a pandemic, but bringing people together physically who share a more immediate common life in neighborhoods and regions and communities and even countries, I think this remains and will continue to have importance. Part of the, one of the great losses brought about as a result of the widening inequality is that there are fewer and fewer class mixing institutions and occasions. There are fewer and fewer public places and common spaces that gather people together in person, in the ecclesia, so to speak, but also within civil society. And this is because we've had a segmentation of society based on success, which is back to our theme of winners and losers. Those of us who are, those who are affluent and those who are of modest means increasingly live separate lives. We live and work and shop and play in different places. We send our kids to different schools. There are fewer and fewer civic public institutions, whether playgrounds, recreational areas, cultural institutions, public transportation, sports, sports gathering places that bring people together. This is important because democracy does not require perfect equality. But what it does require is that people from different social backgrounds encounter one another, bump up against one another in the course of their everyday lives, because this is how we learn to negotiate and to abide our differences. And this is how we come to care for the common good. So in addition to creating civic media, which I think is very important, we have to supplement online platforms with common uh, spaces and public places that bring people together in person, face to face. So this is a big project, but I think we need to work from both directions at once. Would you agree with that? What do you think? I would. I'm totally with you and uh, in, 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 in person and online as we are now. Yeah. I hope right. absolutely to help this kind of project. And I'm sure that all the people that has been listening until now to this conversation will join the project, uh, which is uh, not only uh, revolutionary is also evolutionary it creates completely new new possibilities um i'm i'm sorry it's uh, it's the end of our time with the, with this conversation you can go ahead and uh, take a look at the book that we are talking about uh which is the tyranny of merit uh, la tirania del merito uh the michael sandel uh Okay, we he, we had uh, we had him here talking about uh, the common good in a in a in a in a moment in of of history in which we look at uh, uh, very differentiated this unequal society and inequality seems to become as uh, Michael Sandel has said seems to become division. It's no more. Just inequality is division of society and fragmentation of society. People that don't encounter a different kind of, uh, of, of experiences. Uh, and the common good is having all these people together debating about their own future. And they can do it. It's possible to do it. And if you allow me, if we uh if we want we can do it thank you Ms. professor 
Michael Sandel, it was an honor to talk to you and I hope uh, everybody will continue thinking about what you have just said. Well, thank you. It's really been an honor for me to engage with you in this conversation, which I hope will continue when the pandemic restrictions fade away. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you and your students in Italy. But thank you so much for this. Thank you.